<laughs> All right, are we okay? okay, James? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending today's webinar. It's on the topic of execution and control of operations. Uh, as James said, I'm Greg Foskey. I work with Technology Transfer Services. I'm the CFO, but I'm also a, uh, an instructor and consultant in the areas of uh, supply chain, logistics, and whatnot. Uh, this webinar has been provided thanks to Florida West Coast Chapter. You can see the, uh, uh, the um, URL on the right side of the, uh, of the slide. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be teaching a CPIM certification preparation class for this on four Saturdays starting on August 27th. It's going to be up in the Carrollwood area, for those of you that are familiar with the Tampa area, and uh, it's going to go for four, four Saturdays. They won't be consecutive because of uh, Labor Day. Uh, for more information, you can contact me at, at the email here or the phone number. Or, or just register at the uh, apextampabay.org uh, website. So if, uh, if you have any questions during the program, uh, please use the chat function. I'll either answer them at the point you send them or, or uh, wait, wait until the end, depending on uh, relevance. Uh, my contact information, I'm also going to share that at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm going to conference if anybody uh, wants to uh, meet up while we're, uh, while we're there. I'd, I'd, Love to meet some of you. So uh, uh, let's see, status. Um, so my prior APEX webinars that uh, some of you may have attended have gone from the basics, uh, fundamentals of supply chain through the master planning uh, to planning and control of operations. Uh, today we're going to go, uh, go down uh, to the execution and control activities. I'm going to try to slow myself down. I'm normally a, a little faster talker, but I think what's going on with this is I'm taking this webinar and building on a lot of the prior knowledge uh, that we've pushed out in, in the prior webinars. So uh, if you've participated in those, you'll have a bit more of a foundation of the knowledge uh, than those that are joining me for the first time. Uh, since these uh, programs are built on the prior knowledge, I'll get a little bit more detailed in some areas, but there's going to be a lot more detail that is, uh, uh, is going to be uh, available in the classes that, we, that I teach. So some of you are uh, probably familiar with this. It's the manufacturing, planning, and control uh, chart that APEX puts together. You can see a lot of the long-term activities up on the top coming down from strategic and business planning through uh, master planning of resources, detailed scheduling and planning. Uh, the area that I've got highlighted in, in red is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on the scheduling, production control, production reporting type of activities. Uh, I'm going to break it into five uh, short subsections. Uh, manufacturing execution and control, inventory execution and control, cost controls, and uh, accounting methods, and uh, I'll explain why why we put that into this uh, presentation today. Quality control, and some other areas that need to be managed in in the execution and control of operations. Uh, since since I've talked about inventory management in prior webinars, I'm not going to put as much focus on that today as the operations and uh, and quality and and accounting side of things. All right, so uh, let's start out in the manufacturing section. Uh, we're going to look at uh, manufacturing environments, process types, layouts, planning methods, and, uh, and systems that are used. In different, uh, in different manufacturing environments, uh, we use uh, different product lines with varying volumes, uh, different product varieties, and Customer lead time. So the manufacturing environment has to uh, has to match the needs, uh, the expectations of the customers. Uh, here, here I'm showing four environments uh, for products like uh, custom suits, say Class A office buildings or other one of a kind products. Uh, up on the top left, an engineer to order environment is is more typical uh, for items that are make to order. Uh, it's typical that a company will wait to produce until they receive customer orders. So you're not going to use an MRP system. You're not going to rely on, on 
forecasts and whatnot for, for make to order items. Uh, if you're assembling to order, uh, typically a base model of a laptop computer, say, uh, you'll pre-build that. It'll be sitting on the shelf waiting for customers to uh, tell you that they want some customization to that, uh, maybe larger hard drives, custom ports, screens, sound systems, uh, things like that, wireless capabilities. On, on the make to stock items, uh, those are items that you're going to look at uh, getting from Granger, Walmart, uh, other off-the-shelf uh, uh, retailers, th those types of products. So these are the four categories of uh, manufacturing item environments that at least we're going to pay attention to today. You can uh, you can see, and I can't read my own uh, screen that well, but uh, uh, within these manufacturing environments, uh, different process types are going to be used. So based on the volumes, varieties, process, uh, process complexities, again, uh, when the product's unique, when it's large, uh, like we talked, it's best to fit up in the project area. So your engineer to order building suits, uh, that's your project type, that's your engineer to order products. Uh, moving down the line, uh, your job shops uh, will be set up with similar equipment kept physically together by, by function. So you got your machine shop, you got your paint area, whatnot. These are uh, typically managed through routings. So routings are typically created to guide the work through uh, a job shop type of an environment. When you move, uh, when you move further down, you've got batch, uh, batch processing, uh, batch manufacturing moves through uh, manufacturing steps in groups or batches. Moving down further, uh, you see the repetitive manufacturing. Uh, with repetitive manufacturing, there are other opportunities, there are pros and cons, but you can minimize setups. Uh, inventories and lead times by using production lines or work cells. So your product, uh, product as opposed to process, process driven. Uh, work orders aren't needed. Uh, scheduling is based on production rates, so you don't need work orders out on the floor for uh, for work cell type of flows. Uh, the the environment's not based on speed or volume considerations either. And finally, down uh, down at the bottom here, mass uh, you know, mass production, uh, continuous production is based on specific, uh, often expensive and specialized equipment that can be used uh, to keep material flowing. So think of uh, uh, think of oil refineries and things like that. Uh, flowing materials will be flowing continuously through very expensive equipment uh, during the production process. These typically have uh, have fixed routings. Uh, setups setups uh, are very infrequent or may uh, may never may never change. Then uh, then you start to look at whether you're going to uh, push your product through your manufacturing environment or you're going to pull it. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Apex disciplines of push versus pull, they're they're managed differently. Push you're typically looking at a forecast. Pull, you're typically looking at uh, Kanban type of activities. So some environments work best with, uh, with push type systems uh, managed with an MRP program for the inventory side. Uh, push usually relies heavily on forecasted demand. It's especially true uh, when you've got things with long lead time items, uh, items with, uh, with uncertain demand. Other, other environments like continuous process, uh, the assemble to order and make to order that we talked about earlier uh, can can use lean principles and concepts like continuous flow and Kanban, where you can't use that in uh, as well in a push environment. Uh, one objective of uh, lean pull environment is to significantly reduce unnecessary whip inventory, and we'll get into that uh, in several different ways throughout this webinar. So uh, here you see some planning decisions that need to be made in the process and uh, planning decisions that need to be made in the systems area. These are, uh, these are in support of the pr production process and, uh, and they're interrelated. The process and system decisions need to be made before effective execution and control can be accomplished since it's not just about uh, the, the operation itself. It's not... Um, uh, the discrete operation being performed is, is one thing, but it's also the interfaces. 
when we looked at the uh, the APIC slide earlier, it's not just about what's happening in the execution and control. It's about what's happening as it relates to detailed scheduling and planning uh, interfaces in and in and outside of the ECO environment. So when you look at that and you try to plan this out, when you look at whether you're going to go batch or you're going to go flow, whether you're going to do your production and inventory planning through MRP, or if you're going to use a lean system, uh, look at your input and output. Look at your needs. Look at your controls. What needs to be in place? One of the uh, one of the tools I like to use. Uh, for this is is a SIPOC diagram. So here's an example of, of one, and it's a quick example of a process where uh, you, you need shop tools. Shop tool requirements are identified by the part number, uh, the upcoming job, and you see the suppliers. The SIPOC is suppliers, uh, inputs, Pro, what, what is the process? The process is pulling the, uh, the proper tooling, making sure that it's, it's correct. And then you've got your outputs and, and who your customers are. So it, it gives you an end-to-end -end understanding of the critical activities, the critical inputs, what your customers expect, the voice of the customer, uh, how, how you're going to conduct each process and what your needs are uh, outside of your own domain. Here you see uh, on the inputs, uh, there are the part numbers, what's the tooling that's required, uh, how much, what quantity, and any descriptive information. So this is what you would be getting from your, uh, from your facilities or your suppliers. Uh, they can be communicated in different ways. Uh, you can uh, communicate them to an order picker electronically. You can do it uh, via work order. Uh, stock, you, can do, you can add more fields to this too, so even uh, stock locations uh, can be added so that it, it makes it a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more efficient in the in the picking of the tooling. So again, one example: uh, the tooling picker uh, looks up a location, uh, checks the tooling, makes sure that it's um, uh, that it conforms, that it's the right quality, the right quantity, and uh, it can service his internal customer who needs to use that in the production of uh, of parts. On the uh, uh, execution and control interfaces, primary interfaces exist between uh, ECO, the MRP system for material planning things, and, and CRP for capacity planning. Uh, you can see that I added in a, an arrow that's, uh, that's not typically there from, uh, from the APIC slides, but uh, MRP and CRP do have a strong tie, more in the detailed scheduling and planning side of things. But we're looking at this and saying for ECO and the planning and scheduling to be functional with MRP and CRP as the systems, uh, we're going to look at it not only from the production scheduling and control side of things, but also uh, the purchasing scheduling and control, what, what materials are required, what capacities are needed from our, uh, from our suppliers. Um, so th this is the this is, uh, fact that a lot of what we're doing in the execution and control is is integrated with other areas. That's that's the point of that slide. So now uh, uh, you look at forward scheduling and backward scheduling. What what are the differences when uh, when an object uh, uh, is produced to stock and you want to keep your equipment running uh, as full your capacity as full as possible. You're going to schedule to a forecast. You're going to load up that piece of equipment and just start producing it, whether or not you have uh, customer orders. So uh, this is this is typical on critical work centers where you might have bottleneck operations. You want to keep it it loaded up all the time. When planning is primarily customer order due date based, it's going to be scheduled uh, backward from the date it's uh, uh, it's to be completed, so that you you can hit your promised delivery date. Now, the second technique may not may not keep equipment as busy, and it probably won't, but but it's also not going to build up as much inventory uh, before the customer due dates. So, uh, again, I think the point here is if you want to build up your inventories, uh, you know, forward scheduling is the way to go. If you just want to meet your customer expectations, keep your uh, cash flow up, your inventory is down. Uh, backward scheduling is the way to go, and and, a, and capacity is. 
available capacity, I guess, is going to be a, a big part of that choice. So, you know, I was talking about bottlenecks. I'm I'm trying to illustrate illustrate one here with uh, like a Venturi. So we'll call this a pacemaker. That's the that's the terminology that Apex uses for it. Um, so we've got forward scheduling we talked about. We've got backward scheduling. Now we've got a constraint in the system. So how do we deal with this? Uh, so this environment may be subject to a significant constraining operation in the middle of the process, like here, operation 20. If this is the case, uh, it's going to be necessary to keep this operation fully utilized and work everything else, both upstream and downstream from this operation, uh, after it's been scheduled. So we're going to schedule uh, the up and downstream operations based on this particular uh, bottleneck or this pace, pacemaker uh, item. So uh, it's identified in uh, lean process terminology as, as this. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to read a quote. Uh, the resource that is scheduled based on the customer demand rate for that specific value stream it is the resource that performs an operation or process that governs the flow of the rest of the materials along the value stream. The purpose behind scheduling this process first is to maintain a smooth flow through the manufacturing plant. A large buffer inventory is provided ahead of the pacemaker, then, then is uh, put into other uh, position in other uh, operations. Uh, just so that the pacemaker can be continually operating. Uh, so, okay, so for this scheduling uh, uh, production to run efficiently, other types of scheduling and inventory planning techniques are going to be needed. Uh, we're talking about MRP, we're talking about lean. Uh, what what these are going to be based on are, are programs like you, you see in, or you, you've read in the goal, like theory of constraints or a process called hijunka. Um, and th those will be explained a lot more in in the upcoming classes. I think that's just going to get into too much detail uh, for this webinar. So now, uh, now that we have an understanding as to the different systems, the different uh, methods, the different uh, procedures uh, that that we can use, we need to start looking at our um, our inputs and outputs. Well, we've got planned inputs, we've got uh, actual inputs, you know, what's coming into a particular work center. We've got planned outputs, how, how much are we going to produce, and the actual outputs. And then what are the deviations, the input deviation, uh, the output deviation. So part of the ECO is managing the planned inputs and actual inputs along with the planned, input, uh, planned and out, actual outputs. Uh, since we deal with supplier problems, uh, equipment problems, customer order changes, uh, more, more things like that, the dynamics uh, between these four have to be managed together. You can't look at any one of these in isolation. Sometimes they work in alignment. Uh, sometimes they're opposed to each other. So uh, here is an example. You can see this company expects to receive 280 orders up, up on the right-hand side, the total planned input over the next six weeks and ship 300, reducing the backlog of orders uh, from 50 to 30. Here, uh, what you can see is the actual orders received were slightly lower at 276. But the actual shipments uh, made were significantly lower than planned at 277. So what's happened is our, our effort to drop uh, the backlog by 30 to get caught up a little bit, if you will, uh, as planned, uh, ended up resulting with uh, a backlog of 49. So we didn't do uh, such a good job on, on getting that backlog down for, for a couple of reasons. And that's why you need to make sure that uh, your, uh, your understanding and your in involvement with the inputs and outputs is, is integrated. So uh, other ECO considerations. Um, what, what kind of dispatching are you going to do? Dispatching options, your constraints, your bottlenecks, uh, lead times and setup times, uh, lot sizes, uh, sequence of operations. So we, uh, we look at Operation 10, 20, 30 on that a uh, couple of slides ago. A lot of operations, your batch processes, your job shops, 
a very complex uh, sequence of operations. So how do we plan those things out? It's a lot more difficult than a product or a line flow or a cell type of, uh, type of environment. And flexibility. Uh, flexibility to outsource or just uh, move away from uh, the published routings in-house. Keep it in-house, but maybe work, uh, work from different, different work centers. So looking at uh, our cycle times, how, mo how long does it take me to get from the point I pull my, uh, pull my materials off the shelf and get it uh, available to ship? That's, uh, that's one uh, thing that companies look at, but a way to sync that up uh, in, and make sure that you're meeting customer requirements is by using something called tack time. And uh, it's a German term, comes, comes from a German term. Uh, a component of total lead time is the manufacturing cycle time. Uh, this, um, the tack time, uh, it takes to successfully complete the tasks uh, required for work in process. So tack time is, is the rate at which products or services uh, should be produced to meet customer demand. And so tack time sets the pace of production to match uh, the rate of customer demand. So uh, a key assumption is that demand is uniform in this in this environment, otherwise there's going to be too much dynamic, too much gyration in the inputs and outputs. You know, running to attack time isn't going to be effective if you've got too much uh, too much of a variety there. So within whatever scheduling period, uh, whatever scheduling period you're looking at, how whether it's hours or or days or weeks. So if we if we operate in a lean environment, we're going to keep production synchronized with customer demand. This concept creates a pace uh, based on cycle times and demand per period. Uh, when these are synchronized, our process is said to be in conformance. So it's it's going to be uh, in conformance to uh, tack time. A simple illustration here: uh, I've got seven and a half hours uh, per day. You know, taking a couple of a uh, couple of breaks, uh, 3,600 seconds uh, per hour, so that's 60, 60 minutes times 60 seconds. We take that and divide by the number of pieces demanded uh, over that particular ship, which you can see here is 500. So this equals the need to produce one piece every 54 seconds in order to consistently meet, uh, meet the customer demand, customer requirements. Uh, these terms uh, and formulas have a lot of convolution to them. So my recommendation is this, if you're going to engage in a serious conversation about something like this, it's well, uh, it's well worth it if, you're, if your particular operation, your particular company or, or subset of it would benefit from tack time. I'd tell you, look further at some APIX documentation, go to apix.org, uh, type in tack time and look at it. Uh, there's another good blog site that I like for uh, stuff like this, for those of you that are, want to drill down a little bit deeper on this. It's called I, like little I, uh, six sigma dot com. So you can uh, you can find more information there and uh, a lot more in depth. So getting getting a little crazier with this uh, with this initial uh, chart that I, we put together. I'm now going to look at how do we tie in the material flows that uh, uh, to the project, uh, job shops, the engineer to orders, make the stock the whole that whole group. Uh, so in this slide, uh, what I've uh, attempted to do is put manufacturing environments, process types, material flows all together. Um, most mid-sized to larger environments use a combination of these. So you're not, uh, most companies aren't just going to pick uh, one or the other, depending on customer requirements and uh, the ability to pre-build. Uh, you're going to you're going to be running uh, several of these. It all it also depends on the uh, where you're at in the product life cycle, you might start out with uh, with a project type of orientation, just uh, doing a bench build on something as as you've got a new product introduced. As it begins to evolve, you might get into a job shop uh, environment. As it begins to evolve further, and you get into a mature period for that uh, for that product, uh, you might be moving into a project oriented or a cellular type of uh, process. So. There are, there are variables that go on over time and over product types and customer expectations. Layouts are going to be based on these. They're going to be based on the volumes, the varieties, 
uh, and whether the environment is process focused or, or product focused. So process focused environments are going to be suitable to companies whose technology or materials are complex and capital intensive. Uh, these environments can be, uh, can be highly controlled. Uh, sometimes they're controlled from a central planning department, somebody that's not right there out on the floor. So uh, you, can, you can manage those environments from a, from a remote location, uh, maybe from a corporate office. But, but when you get into the product-focused environments, these are more suitable for uh, changes in customer expectations, uh, expectations of responsiveness, uh, innovation, uh, product and design flexibility. So when you're looking at all of that, you need a lot more dynamic capability and you're going to uh, be planning uh, for this need for speed, I guess. Uh, uh, the planning process are best suited to be uh, decentralized where you've got, you've got your planning activities uh, geographically um, involved in the same location as your, as your processes. So I, I hope I hope everybody got some, something out of that last section. Uh, if you have any questions, chat them uh, to me, or uh, I'll have my contact information again at the end. So again, inventory execution and control, it's a, it's a big piece of ECO, but I'm not going to dig into a lot of detail today because we've talked about it in prior webinars more than, more than the other areas. So uh, you know, here's here's a whopper of an issue to deal with when it comes to inventory, and, and how much to keep on hand. There there are a lot of things to consider whether you're the uh, CFO or whether you're the sales and marketing manager, uh, operations manager, uh, supply chain manager. Decisions on what items to keep on hand and how much uh, of each needs to be based on the company's cash position. What are the market expectations? Uh, competitive forces uh, working against you in the marketplace. You know what what's going to be the expectation of your customers, where you're at in the product's life cycle, lead times, uh, variability in supply and demand, uh, space, uh, environmental concerns, uh, things like shelf life, uh, the breadth of the supply base. You know, do you are you sole sourced, single sourced, or is there an op opportunity to get uh, to get things uh, received quickly? Too much on hand and, and cash flow suffers. We know that uh, profits suffer. But if you have too little, customer service is also going to suffer, which uh, is, uh, it's ultimately going to adversely affect your, your revenues and therefore your profits too. So uh, right, uh, the right amount is, is what, we, what we strive for. Uh, some of the ways inventory can be better managed is through cycle counting, the use of barcoding, uh, RFID tags, uh, meaningful number uh, numbering systems, intelligent numbering systems, uh, and a proper classification, making sure that uh, we've got things in the right ABC groupings, we've got things in the right uh, commodity groupings, so that we can we can plan them out appropriately. Uh, benefits of work in process reduction uh, by l by limiting work in process through Kanban's single piece flows, other other means that we talked about, continuous flow. Uh, the footprint of the operation can be shrunk, so you need less. Uh, you need less space. You need less of a building. Um, uh, flow flow distances can be reduced. Uh, visibility for for both material handling and pedestrian traffic safety. You know, looking at safety issues, you got a bunch of uh, inventory sitting around on the floor. Uh, it's going to be difficult for the operators to uh, see to to figure out what they're going to need next. So Kanban uh, Kanban's help on the work. Uh, whip reduction, I guess. Uh, priorities can be clarified. There's there's less to pick from out on the floor, and feedback loops become more obvious. So you're not uh, uh, you're not looking at a mess. Uh, it also reduces potential scrap, uh, obsolescence, and and again the need for working capital. Uh, inventory adjustments. We got different types. Uh, looking at performance to plan, looking at variances, um, uh, you know, adjustments, uh, adjustments as needed. Um, uh, these things can be can be done through cycle counts. Uh, you know, we can we can have we can be forced to make inventory adjustments because we've got defective items. Uh, maybe we have to write stuff off because it's obsolete. 
uh, there might be problems with receiving and other data entry errors, uh, wrong bills of material, incorrect bills, uh, overconsumption, uh, damage from transit and handling, uh, not uh, product not being to spec, um, uh, and, and stuff like shrink, pilferage, uh, many more items like that. Uh, so those those are some of the some of the reasons why we would make inventory adjustments. So now uh, let's shift over to the accounting side of things, the cost accounting in particular, uh, different accounting methods. Uh, um, the Apex, Apex definitions, uh, I'm just gonna read these. Uh, cost control, we're gonna be applying procedures that monitor the progress of operations against authorized budgets. Variance reports such as purchase price variance and usage variances are examples of reports used for cost control. Uh, on the cost accounting side, the branch of accounting that is concerned with recording and reporting business operating costs. It includes the, the reporting of costs by department, activities, and products. Departmental performance uh, to aggregate budgets is, is monitored and uh, volume and cost are essential inputs here. So. Cost control is needed to assure that operations are not just producing what's, what's expected, but that they're, they're doing it while they're meeting their operational budgets. So this is why, why I said we need to uh, look at the accounting side of things as part of, uh, part of ECO. Uh, different, different ways to, uh, uh, to look at your cost control uh, models. Uh, you, you've got cost accounting approaches like that shown on the left. A company will use different means to monitor and control uh, it's manufacturing costs. You see a job costing, process costing, uh, absorption, whatnot. On the, on the right-hand side, uh, you've got activity-based costing. Uh, it's, it's an accounting model that uh, doesn't necessarily cover all of the manufacturing costs. And that, that may seem counterintuitive. You know, why not cover all of your manufacturing costs? But I'll explain that uh, in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, and, and on top of that, what, what seems... Uh, Peculiar that you don't want to you don't want to necessarily uh, identify all of the manufacturing costs. We're going to throw some non-manufacturing costs in here, uh, such as uh, targeted sales and, and marketing costs that can be tied to a specific product or group of products. So I'm showing these uh, I'm showing these side by side uh, so that you can see the differences. You can see the key functions of of each of them. Uh, the reality is a both of these, if you're an accounting uh, major like I was, there, there are hundreds of textbooks, thousands of articles being written on these things. And, uh, you know, we're, not, we're definitely not going to dig into that level of detail uh, today or in the class. So uh, continuing on, product, uh, product versus period costs. I, I introduced this earlier uh, in the inventory section. Here's more information about it. Costs can be linked to products being made or the periods in which the costs are incurred. Both have advantages and disadvantages based on the company's uh, manufacturing environments and the, and the um, market conditions. So here on, on the left-hand side, I've, I've shown product costs that have a 200% allocation of manufacturing overhead costs as a percentage of direct labor. Uh, direct labor here is $125. We're going to take all of our aggregate manufacturing overhead and say, how many dollars do we spend on manufacturing overhead? How many dollars do we spend on direct labor? And what's that ratio? And then every direct labor dollar that we uh, spend, we're going to have an associated uh, markup of that with, with manufacturing overhead. Items that, that fall into that overhead category would be uh, things like perishable tooling, uh, utilities uh, that are consumed in, in the making of the product, not the, not the office utilities, but uh, manufacturing, uh, supervisor salaries, uh, things like that. So there are more, uh, there are more costs uh, on this than, uh, than just these direct costs. These are typically not manufacturing costs and are not typically controllable by the operations management people. So SG&A, sales, general, administrative type of costs, uh, these would typically be handled as period costs for things like uh, rent and leases and uh, sales commissions, 
uh, bookkeeper salaries as opposed to uh, uh, operation salaries. Uh, so these types of things will will be included in period costs. So uh, as mentioned in the last slide, this is the way traditional cost accounting handles their expenses, but not the way they're handled in activity-based costing. And why is this important? Uh, well, because what we want to do is we want to make sure that we've got the right accounting system. So as we hold people um, as we hold people accountable for their performance, we make sure that we're not uh, uh, messing up on the metrics. We don't have a metric that's inappropriate for that activity or that's uh, constantly being changed or polluted by bad data. So uh, the activity-based costing, again, assigns costs based on uh, the real cost, the uh, real cause of overhead expenses. Uh, ABC accounting, uh, activity-based costing is called ABC accounting also. So ABC accounting also assigns costs to products as, as they're actually incurred. By using multiple cost pools, a better understanding of the real product costs emerge. So we're not just taking one aggregate manufacturing overhead, we're taking and identifying costs by the receiving area, by the, by the warehouse, things like that. So we'll, we'll develop cost pools. Uh, now what's happened is this, this type of accounting, for those of you that haven't been exposed to it, it's becoming more important uh, over the years, over I'd say the last 30 years, uh, mainly, mainly because of the significant increase in overheads. You look at uh, a lot of the uh, labor, labor reductions that are going on and still the, uh, the overhead costs that are associated with, with an operation. So, when you start to get into uh, changing from 200% uh, that I showed you earlier up to overhead uh, rates of 1,000% or, or higher, which I've seen, these, uh, the correlation between direct labor and these overhead costs uh, is, is almost removed. It uh, uh, loses its real relationship. So uh, ABC cost, costing is becoming stronger and stronger as a contributor. Uh, to sound uh, business decision making. So if there's a legacy product that the company has been selling and manufacturing for years, all of the bugs have been worked out of it, and there's a steady stream of solid income, this type of product is typically referred to as a cash cow. And this is, uh, this is why you would look at some of these things like sales and marketing expenses and say, you know, if this thing is just uh, is got a steady state, we don't have a lot of sales or marketing initiatives on it anymore. Why put some of those costs in uh, just because they're there? It, it wouldn't be necessary to put a proportional amount of the overhead cost to this product since it requires uh, little engineering, quality, uh, supervision, or planning intervention anymore. Uh, placing an inappropriate amount, the, the other problem with that is placing uh, an inappropriate amount of overhead cost to this product uh, can cause a company to erroneously decide to raise the price on it uh, to maintain or improve their profit margins. When they do that, uh, if, if it's a competitive market, you could be uh, having you could be doing a major uh, major error by uh, potentially losing uh, losing sales as a result of erroneously increasing your sales price. Uh, on the other hand, uh, products that are just being launched. Uh, these, these can require a significant amount of startup costs, marketing costs, testing, uh, packaging design, things like that. And in order to, under, to understand whether this product is going to make money in the short term, all of the costs associated with the launch need to be applied properly. You're not going to try to disperse them out to the other, uh, the other products just so that you've got a consistent percentage. Uh, I'm hoping this makes sense uh, for uh, for those of you that aren't accountants in the group. So we're going to dig uh, more into this in, in the classes, but again, it's, it's something that's even beyond, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the core is beyond what, what we would normally cover in, in APEX uh, type of uh, programs. I'll tell you, if, uh, if you like this, if you want to look more at this, like I was talking about I6 Sigma, uh, there's a good uh, there's a good website out there called www.accountingcoach.com for not only for activity based costing but for those of you that might want to dig in for meetings or whatever and get a little bit more information on some accounting 
terminology you may not be as familiar with, go to that site. It's it's a good site. I, I go there a bit. So here here we're going to move into uh, cost of quality or control of quality. I hope I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, hope everybody's still with me. We've got we've got seven slides to go, so hang in there. Um, let's let's look at the quality issues. Uh, good. Uh, so on the left side, uh, what you see is total cost of quality broken down into four categories down at the bottom. The, uh, the internal and external failures are part of the cost of poor quality. On the right side, you can see that uh, through improved conformance, these costs can go down. So you see the internal and external failure costs. You see that particular line on, on, this, uh, on this graph. Uh, so there are, there are books like Quality is Free, Philip Crosby, all these uh, all the quality gurus who are saying quality is free, and and they rationalize it with the fact that it uh, you know uh, the cost of quality will actually bring down your other costs, uh, but but they're actually not zero uh, in order for you to get to 100% conformance. There there are things like appraisal and prevention costs. Uh, these are also shown on the ECM curve as the up the increase. So, the more money you spend on prevention and appraisal activities, it's implied that the uh, the internal and external failure costs will go down. Otherwise, why spend the money on that? But there's a uh, there's a point where uh, you know you've got a, a, the law of diminishing returns. You you put so much effort and so much money into uh, prevention and appraisal, you want 100% uh, assurance that nothing's going to fail. Your total cost is going to uh, is going to go up. So where you want to be is uh, where the ECL is, the economic conformance uh, level, and yeah, that's uh, uh, that's at its lowest level, which is a combination of the ideal cost mix. You're going to analyze what your costs are uh, along the way, see what your uh, failure costs are, what your prevention and appraisal costs are, uh, move them up, take an independent variable and, and change that, see what the impact is on your on your total uh, quality costs. Uh, quality problems can uh, may be dramatic occurrences that show up sporadically. You, you can have these things that aren't, uh, they're not around at all and then all of a sudden, bam, you know, something big hits you. When when you get these, these should be managed by controlling the process, uh, or or you can have chronic uh, chronic problems, just day day in day out type of issues. These chronic issues, they they may not be as dramatic, uh, but they occur over a long period of time. So they may still be you know pennies pennies instead of dollars, but there are so many of them. It's so prevalent that uh, it, it can add up. It can be quite expensive to have those types of Quality problems, and uh, these these type of uh, problems. What you want to do is you want to uh, do continuous improvement efforts. You want to take those things and put together a rapid improvement workshop, uh, a ka uh, kaizen blitz, or things like that, and and address those uh, those processes through continuous improvement. Uh, again, these are going to be covered a lot more in in the upcoming class. Uh, PDCA for for those of you that. I haven't been exposed to that. It, it looks simple. It's it's not. It's like score P for those of you familiar with that with Apex. Uh, looks simple, but it's uh, but it's not. It's a lot more complex. Uh, J. Edwards Deming was the one that put this together. It's a uh, plan, do, check, act model for quality improvement. Uh, within it, we control our quality costs using acceptance sampling, um, SPC control charts, things like that, process capability analyses. Uh, so in the, first, in the first step, the planning step, a plan to affect improvement is developed. You take that plan and in the second step you do. The plan's carried out, uh, try it out you know, on a small scale, uh, do a pilot run of it, see if it's effective, and then put it into place on a larger scale. In the third step, uh, check the effects of the plan are observed. You know what is it that's uh, is it is it accomplishing what's uh, what's desired, and in the last step, the action step, the results are going to be studied, 
uh, to determine what was learned and what can be predicted, what do we change, what, what minor modifications or major modifications, abandoning uh, part of a program uh, need to be done. And it's a, it's a continuing cycle. So you start back in after your act cycle, after, after taking action, go back into your planning, and it's an it's a, it's a eternal loop. PDCA is, uh, there's, there's a person, Shuhart, S-H-E-W-H-A-R-T, and he published the, the Deming's uh, PDCA uh, in, in a book, and, and it's a good reference book. So if, though, if any of you want to look more into this, uh, this type of activity, I'd, I'd say get the Schuhart book. Walter Schuhart is the author. Uh, Deming, Deming also introduced this over in Japan, so they they wanted to give a name of uh, a name that was befitting of uh, of Deming, and so they they call this the Deming Circle. Quality uh, quality is important throughout your process, uh, whether it's direct or indirect activities. These are what folks have defined as the seven basic quality tools, cause and effect diagrams or fish bones, Ishikawa, flow charts, process flow diagrams, value stream maps. All these things are, are uh, similar, checklists, check sheets, uh, Pareto charts, ABC, histograms, control charts, uh, X bar R charts, things like that, scatter diagrams, all of these things are, are valuable tools that can be used in execution and control of the operations. Uh, what you need to do is make sure that you're not using the wrong tool. And so putting together a model that is going to say, if we're going to analyze this, let's use this type of quality tool. Um, uh, tools that can be used to manage quality are numerous, uh, sometimes specially designed. You might have tools uh, given your uh, specialty product that are uh, particular to your manufacturing environment or your product line. Uh, a good place to start looking at quality tools is here, but you, then you can go out, uh, go to Minitab or some of the other quality programs, look at ANOVA's, uh, uh, DMAIC, uh, A3, QFD, FMEAs. There, there, is, there are so many more uh, basic quality tools that, that are out there. Uh, it just depends on what your, what your requirements are. So Japanese, uh, Japanese put together what uh, what they call the new seven, and we're not going to get into these uh, today. Uh, the affinity diagram, interrelationship digraph, uh, matrix diagram, tree diagram, prioritization matrix, process design program chart, uh, activity network uh, programs. So these are uh, uh, these are seven different. Um, tools that the Japanese say are, are actually uh, additional to the, to the basic seven. So a couple more to go. Uh, let's, uh, let's end with a quick slide about people management next. Uh, beyond production, inventory and quality control, a solid execution system uh, has to consider approaches to human resources. These can range from uh, the Taylor scientific approach to uh, worker self-control programs. Taylor, Taylor, Frederick Taylor was a highly influential American engineer, uh, you know, back in the early 1900s. He developed principles of scientific management. He, he, uh, he insisted on top-down management, work to the numbers. Uh, uh, he wasn't really a big employee empowerment uh, type of guy. Um, on the other end, what we're seeing now is the complexity of operations and uh, the inability to centrally manage these things, uh, we're, we're accepting more worker self-control, uh, empowerment programs, things like rapid improvement workshops and Kaizen events that I talked to earlier. Te uh, teams of employees can just put together a Kaizen on their own. Cross-functional workforce teams, uh, targeting specific areas for continuous improvement, uh, use of suggestion programs. So as the velocity of changes uh, grow, ever quicker and the need to make uh, so many decisions along the way uh, faster. Uh, we need to train and depend on our people uh, to pick up more of the decision-making activities. So APEX defines uh, employee empowerment as the practice of giving non-managerial employees 
the responsibility and the power to make decisions regarding their jobs or tasks. It is associated with the practice of transfer of managerial responsibility to the employees, not accountability, responsibility. Uh, empowerment allows the employee to take on responsibility for tasks normally associated with staff specialists. So uh, employees can do things like uh, make scheduling changes, uh, make changes that can uh, benefit quality, some process design changes, and, and even some purchasing decisions. Maybe not on the negotiating front, but uh, you know, some purchasing uh, activity decisions. So for these environments to work, uh, they need to consider the company's leadership style. We can't take one type of employee empowerment uh, program and put it into a culture that it, where it isn't going to work. Uh, the, the existence of job enlargement, job enrichment opportunities, uh, are, do they even exist or is the environment so um, basic that there's very little movement or opportunity to give, give employees opportunities for uh, job enrichment? Uh, employee empowerment, need for training, cross-training programs for these things to work, uh, reward systems, and uh, use of cross-functional work teams. Benefits of employee empowerment programs uh, can be achieved through solid shaping of relevant policies. Make sure that they tie into your business plan, your strategic plan. Make sure they've got a long-term aspect to them and not just uh, short-term need for type of reactions. Uh, setting visuals out on the floor, making sure people understand uh, the goals so they know that uh, what, what the result will be, the, hopefully the favorable result of their involvement and putting time, timely feedback mechanisms in uh, so that you can share successes. People, you know, can, uh, they, they get the applause that's, that's deserved, uh, as, well, uh, as well as looking at the opportunities uh, that have happened in the past and, and looking at those for, for future potential opportunities. So uh, coming up on an hour, and uh, that's it. Uh, we've, we've covered manufacturing execution and control, uh, a little bit of that, inventory execution and control, cost control, cost accounting, uh, control of quality, and uh, other uh, execution and control activities relating to HR. So you can see there, this is uh, broad. This is, uh, this is a lot broader in scope than a lot of the stuff that we did in the prior webinars. And I hope I gave each one of these areas uh, enough uh, attention that you get an understanding as to how complex this is. Uh, it's going to be a good class. I, I would welcome uh, more folks into it. I think that you, you'll get a lot out of it, whether you're uh, going for the CPIM exam or, or not. I think the information that comes out of this one in particular is, is uh, very beneficial for those of you that are working in operations. So uh, do we have any questions? Any questions? Okay. Any, anybody have any questions? Greg, I just want to take a minute to thank you for sharing with us. That was uh, very, very comprehen comprehensive <laughs> and very informative, and I'm sure a lot of us are looking forward to your upcoming class. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, turn off the recording, and then I'm going to actually open up the lines to see if um, we have any questions that people would like to um, ask verbally. So let me turn recording off, and then I'll okay. open up the lines.